Welcome to Pat's Two Cents at God's Church of Love Online. This is Pat Love speaking today for Word Wise Church Online. All right. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Remember that word, bound. Number two, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And that always puts me in mind of Joel chapter two says, I will restore. God is a God of restoration. He will take the, the, the things that we think are dead and lost and wasted in our lives. And verse 25 says, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Now, I'm going to start from here right now, because a lot of times my messages are combined with stories and experiences. The Lord also gives me analogies and they just come off hot off the press. So I have no idea what analogies he's going to use. But for right now, the thing that came to my mind, even this morning when I was praying, is when I was a kid, let's just start with that real quick. When I was a kid, I used to always want to draw. And my mother, who I talked about last week, my mother was very negative as far as negative reinforcement. Um, I wasn't that bright. I was slow. I was sloppy. I was weird. I was creepy. There were a whole lot of things about me that she just did not like. And one of the things she always told me when I was little was, Patty, you just don't have an eye for perspective. Everything was don't, not, can't, you know, everything that would block your ability to pursue anything or your desire to pursue anything, because then you think, well, what's the use? I can't. If my mother says I can't, I can't. So what I want to say to you is there are times when we go through our lives and we don't realize we have placed limits on ourselves or we have accepted limits that have been pushed on us from our childhood, from other people's words, other people's attitudes, whatever the case may be. And for whatever reason those words were applied to us, they were applied. And they end up becoming self-fulfilled prophecies. So what ended up happening was as a child, I couldn't draw. I wanted to draw, but I couldn't. And my mother said I couldn't. But as a child, who's going to expect a little six or seven-year-old to have an eye for perspective? Some do. I didn't. Okay. So what the Lord did Right about the time when I was starting to seek him, I was going to church. I was in the valley of decision to get saved. The Lord reminded me of my mother's old pastels in my in, in the uh, closet. And I pulled them out. And I said, well, let me sit here. And I just had this sudden urge to draw out of nowhere, 26 years of age. So I sat down and I drew a picture of a friend of mine from school where the sun was shining on his face like a, a sunset and the glow was beautiful. And I finished and I took it to my mother's apartment and I said, what do you think? And she said, this is when I knew, this is when I knew that her words held no more power over me. She said, what's that, a photograph of somebody? 
I knew then for her to say that, that I finally got the eye for perspective. It was a gift just dropped in my lap from God. See, God knows things that you go through in life. And I use that as an introductory because there are things that we couldn't do, that we were discouraged about reaching forward. Somebody may have told you you have an odd personality and you became very introverted. You ended up being bound, like Isaiah said. You're bound, you're tied up in knots, you're limited, you're paralyzed, you're crippled. Do you understand what I mean? Because, and some of you are uptight because you're, you've been living in a prison, bound up, tied up in knots, hindered over here, hindered over there, limited here, limited there because of other people's words and opinions of you. And you think that it, some things in your life are a lost cause because of what they said. If my mother said it, if my father said it, it must be so. After all, who knows me better than they? Let me answer that question. God, he knows you better. He's the one who created you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. So no matter what anybody else says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't hold any water. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, some of you right now, some of you may be in your 20s, your 30s, your 50s, your 80s. And when you look in the mirror, you see what you were told you were. You don't know yourself yet, some of you. Some of you have yet to discover all the treasures that God has placed inside of you. Some of you have yet to explore all of your horizons, all of your possibilities, because you feel like you're dumb. You feel like you're ignorant. You feel like you have a weird personality. Nobody likes you. Nobody wants to be around you. You're weird. You're odd. You're the, the odd duck in the crowd. Mm -hmm. So you may have been made fun of as a child, like I was. You may have been bullied, like I was. You may have been rejected over here and rejected over there for all these different reasons. Maybe you were too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny, ugly, a bumpy skin, short hair, long hair, whatever the case. You might have been drop-dead beautiful or drop-dead handsome, but they were jealous of you and told you you were ugly and you believed it. See, the point is, people are fickle. Crucify him one minute, Hosanna in the highest the next. Hosanna in the highest one minute, crucify him the next. People are fickle. And we place all of our store on someone else's opinion of us. And that's not what God wants us to do. So we end up crippled through life if our wife or our husband thinks we're not all that in a bag of chips, then we start shriveling up inside. We start hiding even from ourselves. And we start feeling like a walking apology. Because after all, there's so much wrong with me. I'm a lost cause. How can I expect for God to be able to do anything in my life when I'm so messed up? Uh, you know how we always say in the streets, toe up from the floor. Up. But let me tell you this. God can do anything. There is nothing impossible for God to do. And even though you may not realize who you are, even though you may not understand how valuable you are to God, no matter what people have said, if you draw close to God, really draw close to his bosom, listen to his heartbeat, listen to what he says about you, listen to his love as he pours it into you, you will find out you're way more beautiful than you ever dreamed. 
you will find out there's way more to you than you ever expected. See, one of the things I noticed, there are times when society picks out certain groups of people to look down on. And the thing I noticed is, is the groups that are the most put down, the groups that have been the most rejected in society, when you look at them, almost any average Joe, any run-of-the-mill, normal uh, nobody, I mean, when I say nobody, I mean somebody that has not made public acclaim. They're not world-renowned. They're just the guy down the street, you know, that 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 uh that tutors the kids, or the guy up the street that that works in the in at the park or whatever. Everyday Joes, and some of these are the ones with the most gifts. God has given gifts and abilities that will blow your mind and they're walking up and down the street doing normal jobs while the movie stars have been honed and trained and, and polished and all that and they've been they've been pushed forward but a lot of the people that are rings around them are right here in our neighborhoods the ones that nobody knows about they can act they can sing, they can do public speaking, they can write songs, they can write books, write poetry, they can play the instruments, they can administrate, uh, administer, they can lead and guide groups, they can, they can, they're motivational speakers, they're encouragers, they're, they're pastors, they're doctors, they're whatever they are, they're, they're, some of them are students, some of them are mothers or fathers who have never worked a day in their lives, but they're highly gifted. Now, what I want to say about that is some of you, really, really need to go to God for inner healing. Because I'm going to tell you, when, when your core, when you as an individual are paralyzed or spastic, let's say, you can't do what you would want to do. The athletes that run track, that play basketball, they play football, tennis, wh whatever they play. They're only able to do that because their bodies are in great condition. But if you get a person who is spastic, maybe they have cerebral palsy or polio or something, and they don't have total control over their body parts, that is something that they will never be able to do outside of a miracle from God. But here's the problem with you and me, with most of us as normal individuals. We're not paralyzed or, or spastic in the bodies. We're spastic in the mind. We're spastic in our core, in our belief system. And the problem with that is part of your mind says, I want to do that. The other part of your mind says, forget about it. You'll never arrive. You're too stupid. You're too dumb. Another part of your mind will say, well, I, I've never been able to do that because so-and-so. But that first part of your mind is sitting there wishing, hoping, thinking, praying, wishing you could do this, wishing you could do that. And it's no further away from you than doing it. But you don't do it. You don't approach it. You don't attempt it because you've already lost the battle in your mind. And you've got to get rid of that battle. You've got to get rid of it. The only thing that will put those words to flight is God. He is the only one that will get you where you are to be. Some of you on this line right now, if God said, I want you to be president of the United States, if God said it, you better be it. You better go there. Don't worry about 
if you got a high school diploma or college degree or credential or license. Don't worry about what you don't have, what you can't do. What did God tell Moses? God told Moses, he said, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. What did, what did Moses tell God? But I stutter. Let's just put it like that. I have a speech impediment. And what did God say? Who made your mouth? And then what did Moses say? He got on God's nerves because he still couldn't believe. So God had to send his brother Aaron to be his mouthpiece. But do you see what I mean? If God says do it, he's got all the tools all the qualifications, all the abilities, the giftings, the talents that develop between those two words, do it. But see, here's the problem. This is where we really need a lot of healing. We need to go back and think about all the things that we used to dream about when we were kids before our hopes got dashed before our self-esteem got stomped on and buried. And we need to ask God to bring us back to that place where there are no limits in our imagination. There are no limits in our ability to dream and have goals and aspirations. There are no limits to what we can do for God. Let me share this with you. This might help you understand. Some of you suffer from guilt that was laid on you by the enemy through a person or through a circumstance. Regret is one thing. Guilt is a whole nother baby. And what happens with guilt, and some of you are heavily guilt-ridden, and that's a, a paralytic, I think that's the correct way to say it. That is a form of paralysis that will cause you to be spastic. You want to go forward, but your foot turns sideways. You want to turn right and your body turns left or it just stands there and shakes because it, it doesn't get the memo. So you're not able to get where you want to go because you got too many things going on that are opposing each other confusion, total confusion. And you're sitting up there being bombarded by this. Years ago when I was uh, young, I went swimming. That's when I could swim. And my niece decided she wanted to ride on my back. Well, I didn't use wisdom. So I let her ride on my back and I didn't tell anybody, watch her, make sure she's all right. And she chokes the living daylights out of me because she panics. So now I got to push down to push her over to the side. Do you know, when that whole thing was over, she was okay. And of course, I was okay. But you know, when that whole thing was over, for the next 10 years, I guilt tripped off of that. My guilt trip was, you dummy, you dummy, you dummy, you could have killed your niece. And that thing rode me like a monkey on my back. How many of you have monkeys? How many monkeys do you have hollering in your ear about what you did that was dumb? What you should never have done? How somebody died because of you? How somebody got sick because of you? How this happened because of what you did? How that happened because of what you said? And you're guilt tripping. But you're in Christ now, aren't you? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And what do you do? You forget the fact that God has forgiven you. You have got to forgive yourselves. Many of you have got to forgive yourselves. You got to let it go. Ask God to get it out your system to reassure you that he's forgiven you if you need that. But get it out of your system. The day I got saved, that guilt was gone. The day I gave my heart to the Lord, I noticed the rest of that week, I couldn't find that guilt if I dug for it. It was gone. 
When God wants to use you, when God wants you to go to the next level, there should be no weights, no sins that should easily beset you. There should be nothing pulling you down. And see, that's what Satan does. He sends his monkey demons. He sends his guilt demons. He sends all kind of mess. All those demons that constantly echo those negative words that were spoken over you as a child. And you carry all that everywhere you go. They're just hovering all over you. They may not be in you, but they're on you, baby, like white on rice. And there are times you got to rebuke that bad boy. You got to say, no, time out. No more guilt. No more insecure. I rebuke this in the name of Jesus. I renounce that lie my mother said over me in the name of Jesus. I renounce that lie my father said over me in the name of Jesus. All verbal curses I reject and I cast away from me. They're out of my life for good in Jesus' name. I know I'm not perfect, but God is. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So you live and walk in an attitude of victory. And you continue that way till you start getting some victories in your life. And it's a progressive journey. It's progressive. But the thing you do is you shake off the guilt. You shake off the regrets. You shake off those, those monkeys that ride your back and whisper in your ear to hinder you from being all that God wants you to be. You shake that off. You may have a spouse that makes you feel like you're two inches tall. They may make you feel like you're a roach. I don't care if they even try to hit you. Remember to ask God, do I need to stay in this? Because God doesn't want you getting beat up to prove your love to anybody. Remember that too. That's an attack from Satan, not from God. So you have to remember, you are worthy because you're under Christ. You are a child of the Most High King. You're not a pauper. You're not a nobody. You're not an oops. So you don't have to limp and spasm through your life based on all that crap that Satan tried to pile up on you when you were a kid. The reason he does it is because he doesn't want you to know who you are. The demons are talking to each other, scheming and strategizing. They can't see who they are. We can't let them see who they are. We can't afford to let that happen. Guilt, come here! I mean, it just they just start calling on on the demons to attack you and attack you and attack you. Things go wrong. See, just like your mother said, you're nothing but a failure. You'll never amount up to anything. That's the demon echoing somebody's nonsense into your ear. And you want to quit. You want to quit. You want to run away and hide. That's what Satan does. He uses those emotional, psychological, spiritual wounds. He uses those old words, those old cuss, cusses and, and curses. I was talking to somebody the other night about somebody they knew who every day in their house, they were constantly hollering at their kids, cussing at their kids, slapping them, pushing them, putting them down, talking to them like they're fussing at a at a, at a grown man, they might as well be beating them because they're driving their spirits right out of them. See, hurting people hurt people. That's one of the reasons we need to get healed. Hurting people hurt people. Some of you, you feel like you didn't add up to much. You feel like you didn't amount to much. So what do you do? You push, you push, you push, you strive. That's good. But some of you push other people too. And you try to push them in directions that they really don't want to go. And they're trying to please you. There are a whole lot of ways we do damage and we don't realize it. And we don't always trust that God can get the job done. So we try to do the convincing. And we end up browbeating people, 
browbeating them, nagging them, pushing them, assaulting their own will. You got to be careful with that. Hurting people hurt people, trying to do good and trying to do bad. It just happens. It just happens. Uh, I was watching a woman the other, uh, it was about maybe 20 years ago. Her brother was about 15, 20 years older than she was. And she was a woman that got things done. Boom, boom, boom. Her brother was more laid back. He got things done, but he wasn't in a hurry. And it drove her up the wall. For whatever reason, whatever her little woundings were, because most things that get on your nerves are connected to a lot of old stuff from back in our childhood. We don't realize it, but it is. And she was, you're just a lazy bum. I told you the lights needed to be fixed. If you see something, just do it. Why do I have to tell you? And I'm standing there and other people are standing there. And she's belittling this grown man who didn't start an argument. He didn't do anything wrong. He's paying his rent. And she's belittling him as if he's some little two-year-old brat. It was, it was... I, I was I, I was amazed because this was a born again Christian. Air quote, born again Christian. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you find the sad part with a lot of us in the body of Christ is we believe in Jesus. We believe in God and we believe in his Holy Spirit and his word. But we don't know him. That's where the real nitty gritty hits the road, right there, where the rubber hits the road. Many of us don't really know God. If God walked up to us on the street, we wouldn't even feel his presence. Wouldn't even feel it. Some people know God so, so, so intimately that his presence can be right there. And they're like, oh, God's here. Oh my God, I feel God right now. But what happens? <laughs> the person who doesn't know God would be, what are you talking about? So when you know God, it's easier to overcome these hurdles because you're leaning on him. You know him as if he's tangible. But when you don't know him, this is the problem. When you don't know who God is, when you don't know God's touch, you don't recognize his love. You don't recognize and sense his presence. You don't know his hand when he's intervening in your life. You don't recognize it. You don't see him leading you to scripture to talk to your spirit. You lean to your own understanding and you end up doing a lot more damage doing that. You get hurt, other people get hurt, damage is done all around you because you're living a life of a spastic. That's the reason. You're living a life of a spastic. You know what spastic people do when they don't have control over their limbs? They could be sitting there and one arm could jump up and, and flail out in the air. And before you know it, something gets knocked over and broken. How many people are you knocking over and breaking? And how many people are you allowing to knock you over and break you? There's mayhem in the body of Christ and we're not recognizing it and we're not dealing with it. We have a way of using our holiness, air quote, to abuse others. We'll stand in public in front of the whole church and lamb blast somebody as if they have 10 tails. You see, one of the things I realized is one of the things that gives us a short temper, a short fuse, and things just, just ignite us. We just get angry at this and angry at that. And we're frustrated and we're, we're aggravated. And we're irritated and turned off and ticked off and everything else is because of that stuff in there that's constantly brewing and you won't deal with it. 
because you don't want to think about it. Why don't you want to think about it? It hurts. Yes, it does. It hurts. Yeah, it does. Just like when the doctor has to reset your bone or shove your shoulder back in the socket. Oh, it hurts. But after that hurt, you're good. You're good to go. But if you never put that thing in a socket, you never put it back where it belongs and it's hanging out of joint. Oh, how many of you in the spirit are hanging out of joint? You're out of socket. You're out of sorts. You're constantly in pain, constantly aggravated, constantly upheavals, just constant. I would not want to imagine what it feels like to have a shoulder out of joint and never put back in place. But most people who have had it happen, they know the quicker I get it in, the quicker I'm, I'm good to go. The pain is over. Oh, I'm telling you, it's, it's like we just won't handle the things that are broken in us, the things that are disjointed. It's a lifelong process. This one little message is not going to solve it. It's going to be something you have to take to God day in, day out, day in, day out. And one of the questions you need to keep with you in your wallet, in your head, in your pocket, in your hand, in your book, wherever. Lord, what is wrong with me? That's one. And two. Lord, why do I respond to life like this? Why does that get on my nerves? Why don't I like him? Why don't I like her? Why don't I like you? What is wrong with me? Why does that get me so upset? Why do I ignore this one and give all my attention to that one? Why do I avoid them and I want to hang out with these guys over here? What is it? What is going on in me that makes me shrink from one thing and run to another? Good or bad? What is it? Help me understand me. I don't know. I don't have a clue who I am. But God does. God does. And he will help you navigate through you. He will. See, one of the things I always say, when you give your heart to the Lord, if you go down the right path and, you know, kind of follow suit, he will help you by introducing you to you. Because that's another problem. Not only do we not know God, we don't know ourselves. And don't care to know. Because some of you don't want to know what your weaknesses are. So you don't ask. You just continue using your weakness to do damage. Knowingly or unknowingly. So let's take the minute to ask God. Lord, is it guilt? Is it shame? Is it trauma? Was it the rape? Was it the verbal abuse or the physical abuse or even the emotional abuse? What is it that's got me so tied up in knots? What's got me flinching? What's got me lashing out over here and lashing out over there? What's got me doing that? Why am I so jumpy? Why am I so negative? I start to go forward, but now nah, I ain't got time for that. No, nah, I ain't waiting. No, nah, uh-uh, I'm not. Nah, forget it. Just forget it. Why? Why is that in me? Why have I turned out to be that kind of person? The potter wants to put you back together again. Let him. Let him put you back together again. I guess about two or three years ago, I went through this little quick phase of, of my stomach always being upset when I got through eating. And I remember one night that thing had me tossing and turning all night long. And I said, I ain't going through another night like this. So I sat up in the bed and I said, Lord, I don't have anything to make it happen. But would you please help me regurgitate? I want it up and out. I can't stand doing it. 
but I need relief. And would you believe within two minutes, I started feeling queasy. I grabbed the bag and whoop, it all came up and out. <sighs> Instant relief. A lot of us don't like going through that. We don't like that. We don't like that feeling of something having to come back up. But see, some of you going to have to upchuck some stuff. You have to uh, upchuck your resentment, upchuck your bitterness, upchuck that guilt, upchuck those words that were spoken over you as a child that paralyzed, hindered, and, 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 and crippled you, limited you. So many things you're going to have to upchuck. Rejection, abandonment, whatever. Upchuck it, baby. Because once you get it up and out, you get all that insecurity out. You don't have to walk around telling everybody how wonderful you are and how God's using you and, and trying to validate everything you're doing and let everybody know, oh, yeah, this is good. This is a good thing. Oh, you're missing out of it. No, 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 no. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Just be. Just do it. Don't have to talk it. You don't have to talk a good game. I, I don't know if you ever heard of Minnesota Facts. And I'm gonna I'm closing. I really am. Uh Minnesota Facts. <laughs> this is funny. Minnesota Facts used to play Willie Moscone, and he was Willie Moscone was more dignified, quiet, and sedate and all of that, but you know, they could both shoot some pool. And Minnesota Facts, he steadily dead to dead to dead to dead. The difference between Minnesota Facts and the guy on the street at the pool table is that Minnesota Fats could back up his talk. But it was annoying, very annoying. Sometimes some of you don't realize how annoying you can be because you're always talking your game. Just do it. Let your work talk for you. You don't have to prove yourself. Just do it. God's got your back. He's going to back you. He's going to back you. But some of you are spending as much time in uh, trying to convince people that what you're doing is of God, what you're doing is good, what you're doing is worthy of this corporation, what you're doing is worthy of this investment instead of doing it. <laughs> Let God do the talking for you. And you just do it. What did Jesus say when John said, are you the one? My point here was Jesus did not try to convince John. He told him, don't be offended in me. And he told him to believe his works because they speak for themselves. When he sent his, his messengers, because see, John was disappointed in Jesus because he didn't come rescue him. And that's how we get with God. Rescue me, and God ain't rescuing. And we think, well, hey, are you the one, or should I look for another? Because I look for another now. You ain't doing nothing. I'll find me some help. <laughs> but that's what ends up happening. We wonder. We question. We start doubting. And we start looking, reaching for a lower level. Because it's closer within our reach. It's something we know. We're more familiar with it. So we're ready to bypass. You know, you're taking too long. Because we're leaning to our own understanding. And I was saying that to make a point, And I totally forgot. So let's go on and end this message before I mess it up any further. Lord, I thank you. I bless and praise your name. And I ask you, Father, right now, help us to lean on you. Help us to search you out to help us understand ourselves so that we're slower to respond and quicker to think. As the Bible says, let us be swift to hear and slow to speak. In the name of Jesus, bless us all, Father, as we navigate through this journey called faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Be encouraged. Know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Amen. God bless you.